today we've got this exciting opportunity to write some interview questions for one of our favourite authors. Who can tell me who that author is? This Year 5 class in a primary school in Bristol have recently been reading Michael Morpurgo's novels. Today, they'll be recording a selection of questions that they'd like to put to the author. If we could find out more about Michael Morpurgo as a writer, what would we want to find out? OK, off you go. How do you get ideas for your books? Where do you get the inspiration to yes. write your books from? Where do you get your ideas? Um, why do you write so much about animals? This could be our next one. After a quick brainstorming session, the class have their questions that they'd like to record. Year five, who's got a really searching question for Michael Morpurgo? Matthew. What inspired you to be an author? Um, I was a teacher trying to entertain, educate it, call it what you like, 35 year sixes who absolutely didn't want to be there. And... Um, I found the only way I could get all 35 children listening to me and focused was reading them a story. Then one day I began a story which I thought was pretty good and I looked up and I saw all these faces looking back at me uh, but not engaged. In fact, some of them were looking out the window and some of them were even picking their noses. I mean, can you imagine? And I thought to myself, this story is not working. Oh, oh no. So I went home to my wife, who was also a teacher. I said, what am I going to do? And she said, well, what you mustn't do, and I know this is a teacher of little children, is they must never be bored. So I went in there the next day, and I said to them, OK, I'm not going to go on with that story. I'm going to tell you a story I've made up. Are you all sitting comfortably? Ten minutes, quarter hour later, all 35 of them were just looking at me, you know. He had a small boy and a girl living with him with a cow and a donkey. I thought, yeah, this is great, this is really great. So I wove the story, so we got to half past three at just a heightened moment of excitement, and the bell went, and that was the best moment of my teaching life, because there was this 35 kids all went together, oh, sir, the, you, you got them, you got them. So I did it the next day, the next day, the next day. And I became a storyteller, really, before I was ever a writer. Celeste, do you find it easier to write in a special place? My special place for writing? Yes, I do. I, have a, I write on my bed um, because it's comfortable. Um, what's really good about writing on your bed is that you could, you're, you're relaxed. So you're, I have my knees drawn up, I have a book resting like this, and I have a little pen, and I write, and all my shoulders are relaxed, and my knees are relaxed, and my neck's relaxed, and therefore everything doesn't hurt. I used to find sitting over a table like this really, really hard. Mm -hmm. So I like to be on a bed. Particularly important, though, it has to be quiet. The telephone has not to go. Uh, I don't really want to hear the person arriving. Oh, go away. I don't want distractions. Actually, it's not true. I do want distractions because fundamentally I'm quite lazy and I like to be distracted, but I mustn't be distracted because what you need to do is you need this to be well inside the story when you're writing it and you do not want to be reminded of the world out there, the real world. You need to be living inside the story to make it really, really work. So on my bed and quiet. Gronya, where do you get your ideas from? Um, well, this writer gets his ideas from the world around him. I mean, I spend my life not writing, I spend my life living, um, which is rather important for writers to do. So I meet people, I go places, I read books, I think, uh, I feel. All my senses and my emotions, really, um, are the sources of my stories. Also my memories. I have like a well of memory. Hello, is there anything down there? But the important thing for any writer is to fill up that memory all the time, which means you've got to be living an interesting life. Of course, I remember. And above all, when you're out there living your interesting life, you have to ask questions about it. Ella, what's your question? How do you go about writing a novel? i tell you what I do, and I think this does come from school. Um, what we had to do at school was to produce work, and all kids do this. You have to do your homework and you have to hand it in by the next day or by next Tuesday or by next Wednesday or whatever. And I kind of got used to that psychologically, you know, to do the work by a certain time, otherwise you get into trouble. It's detention. And this grown-up child still does the same thing. So what I do is I promise my publishers a book by the 1st of July. I haven't got a clue what I'm going to write about but what that will do is to give me the impetus, the, the drive, to get, get going 
Um, and I need that. Hmm. Let's say it takes about six months for me to write a book. I would spend about three and a half, four months of that not writing a single word, mm. but dreaming up in my brain, weaving together uh, a story. That story always comes from something that's real. It doesn't matter where it comes from, but something which has touched my heart. Ah, yes. Then I do a lot of research to find out as much as I can about the subject. That's the moment at which I begin to think, well, how am I going to tell this story? What voice will I use to tell this story? Who will tell this story? From what point of view will the story be told? And then there comes that moment when you've done enough thinking and dwelling on it, and there's a blank piece of paper, and you've just got to begin. I kind of speak it down my arm, through my inky finger, onto the page. Um, so that while I'm writing, I'm not bothering at all about what it looks like, what it spells like, uh, even whether I can read this silly thing. I just go as fast as I possibly can, spilling out the story onto the page. And when I've done a thousand words, I stop. And then that afternoon, I'll read it through again, and I'll write it out more neatly so that even I can read it. Then I give it to my wife to read it, and she always says the same thing. Very, very good, Michael, but not as good as War Horse. Um, which really irritates me because War Horse was about 30 years ago, but there we are. And then a year or so later, after someone, wonderful person like Michael Foreman has done the drawings, I get the book in the post, which is the best of moments. Chrissy, why do you write so much about the Second World War? I was born in 1943, which, as you'll know, is two years before the end of the Second World War. So my first memories as a small person were, was of the world trying to recover from this terrible trauma which had gone on for six years. So I saw all around me, uh, I grew up in London, uh, bomb sites. And it was wonderful, extremely dangerous, um, but for a child in those days, a wonderful, wonderful place to explore. Now, I loved all that. And then I suppose around about the age of five, six or seven, I don't honestly remember when, I began to understand actually that something terrible had happened to make these bomb sites the way they were. Um, war was something that didn't just kill people. What it did was to leave behind it a wreck, the wreck of people's lives and the wreck physically of a city or a town or whatever, which takes generations to repair. And I think that's really important to remember. We seem to resort to war so quickly, uh, so impatiently, <clears throat> because we think it solves something. It doesn't solve something. So that's why I write about it. Daniel, why do you write so much about animals? I'm not particularly interested in the animals themselves. I'm interested in how animals and people, particularly young people, get on together. That's what really interests me, the relationship between the two. Um, my wife Claire and myself set up a charity called Farms for City Children. Over 30-something years, we've had 75,000 children come to three different farms. So for 25 years, I was out there with these kids watching them and working with them on the farm with animals. So I was seeing the effect of animals on them and them on the animals. And many, many, many stories have come out of that. I mean, War Horse particularly being the most, um, I suppose, famous and really inspired by one event of a child on the farm. And it was um, a little kid who we had been told by a teacher. He's been to our school for two years and he's not spoken a word, just doesn't speak. Completely wrapped up inside himself. So I left this child alone, it's called Billy, and I watched him out on the farm, and he was brilliant with the animals, you could see he was really enjoying it. Lots of laughing, I could see him laughing with the animals quite a lot. Not a word, not a word, not a word. Then I came in, as I always did, to read to the kids on the last evening, and um, there was one light I saw on the yard, just above the stable, and the horse's head looking out. We had a horse called Hebe, and Hebe was looking out. And then I heard someone talking, and I noticed just below Hebe's head this little boy standing there in his slippers. <coughs> it was Billy. Talking, 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 talking. So I listened, and he was telling this horse all about what he'd done on the farm that day. So what did that tell me? This boy trusted the horse not to laugh, not to mock. He was completely opened up because of that. But the other thing I noticed was that the horse was listening. So of course she couldn't understand the words, but she understood, I'm convinced, the importance of her standing there and listening. And she knew that moment was important. And so that's why when I wrote War Horse, I wrote it in the first person from the horse's point of view. And it doesn't sound silly, because we all know horses can't um, talk and they can't write books. 
But I think if you believe very early on in the story that there can be a relationship between people and horses, then it makes perfect sense for a horse to have a voice. <clears throat> so that's what I mean. They give me so many stories, these children, when they come down. In fact, now I'm not working out there every day. It's, uh, it's not nearly as easy. I have to make more stuff up. Thomas, why do you usually write in the first person? Um, I write in the first person a lot. And using Michael, probably because I'm lazy, but also because I love to feel I'm in the middle of things. I love to feel it's all happening around me. Um, not that I'm controlling it, but it's happening to me. And I love that sense. I always loved it since reading Treasure Island first time. And I think if you do love a book, it's because you feel you're part of it. You're not standing back and kind of examining it. You're kind of deep inside it. Eli, how do you draw the reader into your novels? Very good question. Rather difficult question. Um, how do I draw the reader into my novels? I'm going to say something which I probably shouldn't, um, and that is this. Um, but I don't, while I'm writing it, care about the reader, whether I'm drawing them in or not drawing them in. Whilst I'm actually in the writing of it, I'm not that bothered, and I think I mustn't be, because your mind will be off the story, and you'll be thinking, well, what would a nine-year-old boy or girl be thinking of this? Forget it. I think, over the years, what I have learned is that you've got to begin a story, um, not just for young people, but for anyone, in a way which is full of energy, um, which is your own energy and enthusiasm for the story, and it's that which will draw any reader in. Ooh. Hmm. So I would say forget the reader, tell your story confidently, and then the reader will come on your side. Megan, which stories are you most proud of? Um, I'm not proud of them. Um, I love them. I love the books. Um, and I'm not sure which of them I love most, and I'm not sure it matters. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. What's really important is that you love them when you're, whilst you're writing them. I tend to like the books, it's very strange, that the people that I love, love. So my wife, for instance, likes Warhorse a lot. Well, I quite like my wife. And so when she says she loves Warhorse, it kind of makes me think, oh, well, it must be good then, mustn't it? Um, because it gives her so much pleasure. So Warhorse would be certainly one of them. Actually, its sequel, which no one ever reads, really, is maybe my favourite. It's called Farm Boy. And it's the story of what happens to the horse when the horse comes back from the First World War. And I love it, I think, especially because it's set on my farm in Devon, where I live. And every lane in the story, every field, every tree, virtually, is in that story. I value it enormously as being part of my life. Let me tell you what would make me proud if, because it's what I quite like. I would be a really proud ghost if, in a hundred years' time, I came back and I wooed my way in through some child's window and I looked at the books along the shelf and I found Running Wild or I found Private Peaceful or whatever, any one of the 120 or so books. If I found them there on that child's shelf, I would be the proudest ghost in the world. I would go out there and go beating my ghostly chest, thinking, yeah.